Thank you for those comments. I'm Jeff Simmons with Elanco, and we have a pleasure uh, for our next topic to have a conversation with Her Excellency, Dr. Agnes Kelabata from the United Nations. She is a special envoy for the United Nations Food Systems Summit, which actually will occur next week and was a little bit of a catalyst for why we're here today. Dr. Kelabata comes to this role with significant agricultural experience um, from her upbringing all the way to being the past Minister of Agriculture from Rwanda and recently the leader of the Alliances for a Green Revolution in Africa, an organization that helps enable the use of innovation and technology for farmers in Africa. Um, thank you, Dr. Kelabata, for this opportunity. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, and I believe that, you know, in our past conversations, you and I, we've talked about these two forces that really set up even the summit that you're planning to have next week. Um, and they're really conflicting and they're, and they're, they're significant. And you really can't look at them uh, independently, but you got to look at them exclusively together. Um, and they really are this. How do we nourish a global population where 30% of that population is not getting the calories and the nutrition that it needs? and being able to give them access to this nutrition um, by 2030, and I know that is the goal of, of your summit, and billions globally aren't getting enough, and how to be able to do that. And we see that everything from hunger to obesity or hunger to some companies' healthcare systems. At the same time, this other force that's part of the summit and part of the conversation that we're having here at this meeting as well is around the climate. According to the United Nations, we have just nine years to curb climate warming before we face you know, long-term, maybe uh, unrecoverable changes. These are urgent, we know, in nature, and really there's very little room for error that we've talked about relative to the timing and the ability to do this on the climate side, but at the same time, we've gotta be able to feed this planet. I want to highlight that uh, very importantly here today represented is over 40% of all the animal protein in the world. Meat, milk, eggs, fish, cross boundaries, players from the CEO roles of protein companies to all types of organizations and parts of the value chain. We represent protein. 40% of all the protein calories in the world are represented with animal protein. We play a critical role. We've already started as Dr. Kelbata in this meeting talking about the ability to really do three things. First, nourish this world, give them the calories they need, and to be able to, by the end of this decade, create some stability to food security and create better calories that can help hunger to obesity. At the same time, we believe we can cool the climate. Most of the companies here have already made commitments that by 2030, 2040, 2050, they'll be net zero or climate neutral. We've also seen examples where the third force is actually turning it into economic opportunity, innovation opportunity that will unlock really the next frontier of innovation and economic era for animal protein. We look forward to this dialogue. I'd like to open it up first, Dr. Calabata, for you to make a few comments, and then we'd like to get into some Q&A. Okay. Thank you for those introductory remarks, uh, Jeff. And let me also thank you for getting us to this meeting, br bringing all of us together to have this conversation. Let me start by declaring a conflict. My conflict is very simple. I grew up because my dad had a few cows, my dad had a few animals. So I went to school because our livelihoods uh, were easily shaped uh, by the type of animals we had. And I've seen that mean a whole lot to so many people. The second conflict is that I come from the African continent. And two thirds of the people eat diets that are less in protein and in fat than the daily recommended amounts. So yes, I do understand the role and place of animal protein. Now, coming to the topic here today that brings us here today, there are a number of things we, we need to consider. Let's talk about the hunger to obesity nexus that you talked about. It's just like I just said, it's very important. 
that for countries that are still struggling with the need to have sufficient protein in their diet, it's very important that they have that access to protein. Today we talk about animal protein uh, mostly because the, uh, from a scientific perspective and from a business perspective, there's huge evidence that the amount of protein that you're able to access from that perspective is huge. So it's easy to access. Business models have been designed that are able to drive significant cost down for, produce, for, for consumers. And that's important. Of course, that has a challenges as well, and we'll come, come to that. But the ability to drive protein access is probably the reason between between um, when Norman Bolog was working on, on finding and discovering how we can increase yields, we were 1.5 billion people in the world. And at the time he died, we were about 6 billion people in the world. Because we had figured out affordable ways of feeding ourselves, from mostly from a protein perspective. So businesses have a huge role to ensure that we are able to get and deliver affordable protein to people. And it is glaring in areas where businesses haven't done that. In, in Africa, for example, again, where a significant part of, of the population still lives uh, below the acceptable protein levels in their diets. But we also have significant challenges in parts of the world where people are eating so much more protein than they need. And that has to be addressed. And in fact, all these things are being addressed from a food systems perspective, we are talking about them from a true cost of food perspective. There's, there's a cost to some of the things we are doing from a food systems perspective that we definitely can, can deal with differently. Now, it takes, this takes me to the second challenge that you talked about, the challenge of climate change. So yes, um, uh, agriculture in general is contributing to climate change and uh, animals in some cases have also been called out as contributing to climate change. And we need to address that challenge. We can't just walk away from it. We have, like you said, businesses have committed uh, to be carbon neutral. And so businesses that are in that environment, I really just have to applaud the fact that they, are, they see the opportunity that is in front of them to move towards that carbon neutrality. But I also believe in innovation and trust in the science best that they have behind them. Some of them have some of the best scientists in the world. The opportunity here is to renovate our world. Let's rethink our path. We got here because we're innovative. There's an opportunity too to come to the point, this point where we're asking ourselves, how can we better produce food, and more food, and more protein? How can we make sure that it is not damaging our environment? It is not damaging people that is actually presented in a way that is safe for people and, and for our planet. So those are some of the challenges we have to do. Yeah. Our, our, the summit today definitely calls out the question around uh, the urgency, the fact that we've come to, to crossroads. And this is a, a point where we need to turn the curve and face the direction of we need to do better with food systems. And whether it's animals, whether it is uh, anything else that we are doing, waste, for example, anything that we are doing that is contributing to damaging the environment, we need to do differently. But let's recognize that we probably need to rethink redistribution of access to protein uh, as well, because there are so many people in the world that don't have enough. Yeah. Dr. Calabata, maybe just at a high level, what does success look like next Thursday for you? What, what would you look at the summit? Tell me more of what we should take away as an industry of what's going to occur there. So coming to the summit next week, um, there are a number of areas that are critical for success. Um, leadership, uh, so the, the secretary general coming to this summit called for commitment and ambition. So being able to have a few leaders that are willing to step forward and commit a number of things that are very critical to coming through on SDGs in a number of areas where we are behind, it's going to be extremely important. And that would mean being able to make commitment on um, 
the whole perspective of better feeding, you know, nourishing people, the whole perspective of coming through for climate and biodiversity, but also the whole perspective of coming through on equity, given the challenges we've had with COVID-19. So a few heads of state stepping forward, taking leadership and making commitments will be huge. But also us as constituencies, here we are talking to private sector. Private sector has taken a lead on a number of things, has engaged a lot in the, pre in the summit and the pre-summit process. I also want to see private sector coming forward and committing themselves and committing to, to really measurable things that we can track around the, the change they are going to demonstrate in terms of two areas that I really care about, how we impact climate, but also how we impact equity and decent work uh, for people who work in, in, in value chains. So maybe, Dr. Calabata, I mean, a discussion I know we have is on these commitments. If you look at, with just nine years, we're, we're into the decade. So by the end of this decade, <clears throat> to achieve these 2030 sustainable development goals, I guess, what do you see needs to happen? There's a lot of commitments, but there's not as many roadmaps or actions tied to them. What do you see specific, I think, to livestock, you know, and, and fish producers around the world? What do you see that's critical for us to be considering when it comes to action against these 2030 goals? So let me just say that let's start with two areas. The first area, let's look at those people that are struggling to get enough protein in their diet. Yeah. Those people that are hungry, surely we as private sector, we have figured out a long time ago how to move things around the world. We can put those foods in wherever we put them in and take them around the world and make sure that we are impacting hunger in new ways. We can commit to that. And it still will be good business. It still will be good. We will find good ways of ensuring that we, we, are, we are coming through on our businesses. So let's impact hunger and, and, and access to food in new ways. But let's also not forget that we are working with climate change. Let's find new models of working with animals in ways that actually can reduce the impact of animals on climate change. Let's find new ways of working with our oceans so that we, we can ensure that uh, fish production gets up again and becomes prosperous and becomes part of feeding the world. So there are things we can do uh, around science, around innovation, but private sector can't do it alone. Private sector needs to work with uh, uh, acceptable policies from governments as well. Governments need to put in place policies and policy frameworks that will encourage, but also uh, you know, follow up. You know, it's one thing to encourage private sector and we should and must encourage them by putting the right policies in place, but we also need to follow up to ensure that they are doing the right thing by people and by the environment. Maybe talking about government, you opened a nice avenue there. I think if I spoke to the, for the room that, uh, that I've been with today, you know, there's global protein producers that are very concerned that there's a disconnect with governments understanding the fact that what well, we believe in this room, which is, and we've not only believe it, we're doing it. There's people that are represented in this summit that we're having today that have already reached carbon neutral, that are actually turning the environment into an economic engine and are helping. So my, my question to you is if, you know, if we know as an industry, we can cool the climate and provide 40% of the protein needed for the world, and do it more efficiently with less footprint. And that, that is a reality. There seems to be a disconnect with governments, and maybe even the public, that, hey, we might be four to 15% of the footprint, but we may be 50% of the perceived problem. How do we change that? How do we change it in governments? We, we don't wanna get regulated out of business. We wanna be at the table as part of the solution. G give us some advice today, because. Her Excellency, you, you sit at a, at a place where you, you know the influence of these governments globally better than most of us. Yeah. Um, I think when every time we come at crossroads like that, there's, there's one place that has, for me, has proven the most efficient way to go. We go to science, right? Science, there's a whole lot of science that has told us that animals are impacting our climate, right? Yes. But there's a whole lot of science also that tells us that we can innovate and find solutions around some of the problems that we are causing. 
And, and let me, let's just be clear, uh, animals, yes, may be part of the problem, but there are also ways they can be part of the solution. And we, yes. if we focus on how they become part of the solution, while presenting opportunities for them not to be part of the problem, and there are ways of feeding, there are ways of managing some of the, the products that come from, from animals that can definitely impact, um, impact how much we impact the environment. But there are also ways of managing businesses, just like any other um, huge business, there are ways of managing businesses in ways that they can ha have less footprint. So for me, the issue is that we look at the sales, we look at innovation, but also we look at the realities of the footprint. If, if business can demonstrate that they can actually reduce footprint, then we need to work with them to reduce that footprint. Uh, Dr. Calabata, I think that's gonna be uh... We, we, we could not agree more. <clears throat> All of us as an industry are science-based. We also know that we've got to be, you know, responsible because we're so relevant. Um, but, you know, a carbon neutral protein, animal protein farming operation is possible. And, but, but meanwhile, we also believe we can continue to feed more of the world. That, that high percentage of the African continent that is not getting enough protein. And you're speaking to the group that, that will will be determined to get, get it there. So I think this is critical, but I, I do think there is a disconnect, right? I mean, and maybe just give us, if, you know, just share a little bit and you hear about, hey, let's, let's eat our way out of this. Let's eat less animal protein or just the, the just removal of livestock. I mean, that, that agenda is over there, a little different than your background and the continent of what your continent needs, but help us, whether it's from London to, you know, Rio de Janeiro to, to New York, uh, what, what, what's your thoughts? Give us, give us your narrative on, hey, let's, let's stop eating animal protein. Okay, without focusing on let's stop eating animal pro protein because it would get me into a whole lot of trouble. I will uh, <laughs> I'll tell you this for sure. Um, we need to look at local context in each situation, right? Mm -hmm. We need to look at local context and we need to look at local footprint in each situation. So what, it, what that means is that we cannot fail to attend to the needs that are, that are being, uh, you know, the needs that are, are showing up on yep. the ground in any local context. So that's number one. Number two, we cannot be oblivious to the fact that we are actually impacting the environment. So when you put those together, each situation, each country is going to have to find yep. a path that's why we are talking about national pathways. Each yeah. country is going to have to find a path that works for it. Yeah. No, I, I, I totally agree. I also think as we make progress and as we show models of where we can be, you know, carbon neutral and provide the protein and improve diets and the health of people, I think at the same time, like you say, just like science, we've got to be at all the right tables to collaborate. So um, I think that's great. Maybe share a little bit what's going to come out of Thursday next week at your summit and, and what do you want and need for this industry, the animal protein industry, to play into the action plans coming out of your, your meeting next week? So the meeting next week recognizes two things. Recognizes that we need to come through on SDGs, right? Coming through on SDGs is coming through on end to hunger, coming through on end to poverty, and coming through on health malnutrition, but also coming through on obesity. So this industry has a place to play in all those things, mm -hmm. depending on how you put your business, depending on how you structure your business, depending on what impact your business has. So that's point number one. Can we pay attention to ensuring that those first number one to number three areas of, of sustainable development goals are addressed, right? So that, that's number one. Yep. Number two, and that will, will that this industry has the ability to do that. Number, number two, let's also not bury our heads in the sand and not see the writing on the wall that the IPCC report is telling us that we are actually impacting our environment because doing that means that we will do business in a much more difficult environment in the future. So it's very important for the survival of our businesses to address the issue yeah. of climate. And I do believe that this is industry is responsible enough to do both. So yeah. that's my expectation from the summit next week. Very good. And I think we, we accept that challenge openly because we believe we, one, can and 
and we will. And we as an industry have represented with other challenges to our industry that uh, weaken what food safety, trade, husbandry of our animals to uh, antimicrobial resistance. We played with global issues with the UN before. I would ask for us to be invited to all the critical tables. I think that's important. Collaboration is, you represent Her Excellency more than anybody I've dealt with, I think at the United Nations and we, we're very appreciative of this. Any mm -hmm. final advice? Um, I will say this room is ready. We're committed. We've made our public commitments. We're leaning in. That's why we're all, uh, the, the industries represented uh, the week before at this meeting. Give, give us some final comments of advice, uh, any parting thoughts as, uh, as we conclude today. One of the things that has um, worked well in this summit process is really trying to come around the table and resolve whatever challenges we have together. Talk talk through whatever challenges, have yeah. discussions, and really make sure that we are an open environment for, co for conversation and for challenging each other. I think for me, if we can maintain that approach and be open to listen, get challenged, and challenge back and find solutions and be able to present those solutions to the world, I completely believe in the innovative capability of mankind to deal with the challenges we are having. So I, I just want to encourage you to continue engaging with the rest of the world, with the rest of us, with, with everybody, to ensure that we continue finding solutions together. We can find solutions to the problems we are facing if we continue having conversations. Very good. Well, we, we will conclude this summit talking a lot about commitments we've made and the knowledge we're gaining. <clears throat> we need to gain knowledge. We need to make commitments, but we need these roadmaps. I think your SDGs are an example of roadmaps to get these goals achieved. And then the, the fourth action is build our network. And we look forward to a global animal protein industry that is in network, that is in collaboration with the United Nation, with all the key countries, so that, you know, my, my, my Twitter handle says, my name 2050. I believe in 2050, your continent, the two thirds of the people that don't have enough protein, have protein. And we'll know that's possible at the end of this decade in 2030 with the commitments our industry's made in the animal protein industry. We'll grow, we'll do this, and we'll not be a negative contributor, but a positive contributor to this climate. That's, that I know is the vision that I've gained from all of our industry leaders all over the world that are represented here today. Her Excellency. And and that, sounds like a that sounds like a commitment. That sounds yes. like a huge commitment to the rest of us. And that's what we need. <clears throat> that's what we need from next week's meeting, a commitment to be able to work together to find solutions to the challenges of our world. Yeah. Well, there's not probably many other industries um, going into your summit that met the week before with a collaboration and a commitment mindset. And, you know, to bring 40% of global protein together, we're, we're, we're in this. So please make sure the United Nation knows that and we look forward to being at the table. Thank you very much for your time today, Her Excellency. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your commitment.